Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen und liebe Freunde und Freundinnen, ich möchte euch erstmal und Sie ganz herzlich hier zu dieser Konferenz mit dem Titel Iran, Hamas und Hezbollah, Antisemitismus und Holocaust leugnen begrüßen. Wir freuen uns, dass wir kurz vor dem 30. Jahrestag der Ausrufung der Islamischen Republik Iran so kurzfristig diese Konferenz organisieren konnten, zu der wir namhafte und interessante Referenten gewinnen konnten, bei denen ich mich besonders ähm, herzlich für Ihr Kommen ähm, bedanken will. Also insbesondere natürlich bei den Leuten, die einen sehr weiten ähm, Weg auf sich genommen haben, wie die Gäste aus Israel und aus den USA, Charles Moore, ähm, Mayor Litwak und ähm, David Menashvi. Ähm, ich freue mich auch, dass wir diese Konferenz zusammen mit der Yale Initiative for the Study of Antisemitism an der Yale University und in Kooperation mit dem Center for Iranian Studies der Universität Tel Aviv veranstalten können. Für die gute und nette Zusammenarbeit bedanke ich mich bei Charles Moore, dem Leiter der Yale Initiative. Er versteht jetzt leider gerade gar nichts, weil er das Englisch spricht. Und bei David Menashri, dem Leiter des Centers for Iranian Studies. Ähm, er wird etwas später kommen können erst, ähm, weil er noch eine andere, ähm, einen anderen Termin hat. Ähm, die hier, also beide werden auch heute hier vortragen. Ähm, zudem möchte ich mich bei der Landeszentrale für politische Bildungsarbeit und dem Legacy Heritage Fund ähm, bedanken für die ähm, finanzielle Unterstützung ähm, dieser Veranstaltung und natürlich bei all den Personen, die zur Durchführung dieser Konferenz beigetragen haben. Auch wenn die Konferenz heute den Schwerpunkt auf Antisemitismus und Holocaustleugnung ähm, legt, bedeuten natürlich islamistische Strukturen oder staatsgewordener Islamismus, ähm, die im Iran ähm, die Unterdrückung und Verfolgung von religiösen Minderheiten, von die Unterdrückung von Frauen, Homosexuellen, Transgender-Leuten ähm, und Andersdenkenden. Also das ist natürlich ein Punkt, ähm, auch wenn wir heute den Schwerpunkt gar nicht drauf legen werden, ähm, der bei anderen Konferenzen stärker im Vordergrund steht. Aber das ist auf jeden Fall ein Punkt, den wir nicht vergessen sollten. Und ähm, ich hoffe, dass irgendwann die Situation sich so geändert haben wird, dass es im Iran einen säkularen Staat mit emanzipatorischen Kräften geben wird. Ähm, Was ist die Situation heute? Es gibt die Vernichtungsankündigung des Irans und der islamistischen Organisationen ähm, wie Hamas und Hezbollah gegenüber Israels. Ähm, mal richten sich die Anfeindung gegen Zionisten, die Grenze zur Anfeindung gegen die Juden sind dabei öfters fließend. Ziele der Attacken sind Israelis und Juden, teilweise Amerikaner, jüdische Einrichtungen in der Welt und teilweise auch Europäerinnen ähm, und Europäer. Holocaustleugnung nimmt bei den islamistischen Strukturen einen zentralen Stellenwert ein. Zum einen wird der Holocaust geleugnet, verharmlost und so weiter. Zum anderen wird den Israelis gerade ein solcher gegen die Palästinenser oder Muslime vorgeworfen. Angesichts einer solchen Situation verwundert es, oder vielleicht auch gerade nicht, dass auf die Drohungen und Taten von islamistischen Gruppierungen und islamischen oder islamistischen Staaten ähm, keine adäquate Antwort von deutscher, europäischer und so weiter Seite kommt. Zwar werden meist die Holocaustleugnung und Vernichtungsdrohungen gegen Israel verurteilt, das Handelsvolumen allerdings Deutschlands zum Beispiel mit dem Iran sinkt nicht oder wird zurückgedrängt, sondern ist im letzten Jahr wieder gestiegen. Anstatt die Entwaffnung von Organisationen wie Hamas und Hezbollah ähm, und des Irans wegen Menschenrechtsverletzungen und seines Atomprogramms, insbesondere des Irans, wirtschaftlichen und politischen Sanktionen zu unterziehen, wie das Geschäft mit dem Iran. Hezbollah und Hamas werden teilweise im deutschen Diskurs als adäquate Gesprächspartner präsentiert oder könnten dies in Zukunft sein. Bei Äußerungen von politischen Stiftungen in Deutschland oder entsprechenden Zuständigen von Wirtschaftsvereinigungen ähm, in, oder den deutschen Medien wird im Zuge ähm, 
der gesellschaftlichen Konstellation, die wir haben, dann Obamas Ansprache zum iranischen Neujahrsfest äh, mit Genugtuung aufgenommen. Was wir, die Deutschen, schon immer gemacht haben, mit dem, islamischen, äh, mit dem islamistischen Iran oder mit Hamas und Hezbollah teilweise auf gleiche Augenhöhe zu sprechen, damit Business as usual ähm, betrieben werden kann, wünscht man sich nun eventuell auch von den USA. Nicht die Islamisten scheinen das Problem zu sein, sondern die USA. Sie seien zu iranischen Regime nicht nett genug, sodass dieses sein Atomprogramm vorantreibt. Das sind Äußerungen, die wir teilweise von, in den letzten Tagen auch von Vertreterinnen politischer Stiftungen in Deutschland gehört haben. In persönlichen Gesprächen. Ähm, meiner Meinung nach, oder unserer Meinung nach, handelt es sich dabei um eine Realitätsverkennung. Die Realitätsverkennung, dass sowohl die islamistischen Strukturen ähm, nicht benannt werden und die Potenziale von Terror, der auch nach Europa getragen werden könnten, könnte, sondern auch eine Realitätsverkennung dahingehend, dass die Ideologie der Islamisten und des staatsgewordenen Islamismus Iran einfach verkannt werden. Was diese Konferenz versuchen will, ist über Kernideologeme des Islamismus und des Irans aufzuklären, worunter unter anderem Antisemitismus und Holocaustleugnung fällt. Soweit erstmal von meiner Seite. Ähm, jetzt wird erstmal Charles Moore ein paar Begrüßungsworte noch, auch noch sagen. Und ähm, danach werden wir mit dem ersten Podium anfangen, das Günther Jekili moderieren wird. Danke. Okay, so, so, thank you, Robin. And before I give my presentation, I just wanted to, um, on behalf of ISA, the Yale Initiative for the Interdisciplinary Study of Antisemitism, and also on behalf of uh, David Menashri, who's at, uh, from Tel Aviv University, and Mayor Lipak, who I saw, who's also here from Tel Aviv. Um, we were two of the three sponsoring uh, organizations, but the main organization that put this whole thing together, under Robin's leadership, and Gunter, and, and, and all the other people who work in the, uh, now I'm going to harm your name, the International Bultang Social Antisemitisch for Schonk, in Berlin, sorry for mispronouncing it, um, that it's really been an honor to, to work with you putting this conference together and I think that the, um, this institute really not only does high caliber research but they're on the um, front lines of the cutting edge of making these very important issues um, uh, talked about and discussed and uh, engage with uh, the public at large and students and the NGO community. And their work is really important, and I think that they're filling a vacuum which exists here in Germany and in Berlin. So it's been an honor to work with you. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody, all the speakers who have come, and all the people that helped put this together very much. Um, the people from Tel Aviv and the US who sort of flown in, but all the stuff was, is on the ground has been put together for months, and uh, we're really grateful that we're here today. Um, so today I, I'm going to speak about. Oh, sorry. So excuse me. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Charles. Uh, uh, yeah, perhaps that has been a problem that uh, yeah, my 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 welcome address had been in uh, German. So um, the, the next moderation will make uh, Günther Jekeli. And yeah, I already want to thank to Matthias Künzel and to Charles that they came. And um, also to Mayor Litwak, um, I don't know where he is. Um, might you? Uh, okay, <laughs> thank you um, for coming here. And yeah, and I will give the microphone to Peter. I don't know if it's necessary, but the most of you know probably Matthias Künzel and. Um, Jetzt auch äh, Charles Small und ich habe die Ehre, das kurz anzumoderieren ähm, und vielleicht dann, wenn Fragen sind, äh, das zu übersetzen auf, auf Englisch oder umgekehrt, auch wenn ich da nicht wirklich geschult bin, aber ich werde mein Bestes geben, dass es verständlich ist. Ähm, Charles Small ist ähm, ähm, 
seit um, since when is that EL initiative uh, existing? It's September 2006. September 2006 schon. Um, seitdem gibt es diese EL initiative uh, for interdisciplinary study on end of antisemitism. Und das ist das erste um, große Zentrum in den Vereinigten Staaten, die sich explizit mit Antisemitismus beschäftigen. Und ähm, ich hoffe, dass das auch eine, einen neuen Schub in der Wissenschaft gibt, ähm, sich stärker mit aktuellem Antisemitismus auch äh, zu beschäftigen. Vorher hat äh, Charles äh, zahlreiche Forschungsaufenthalte in, äh, in Großbritannien, Kanada und ähm, Israel ähm, äh, gehabt und ist jetzt sehr bestrebt, solche Initiativen äh, oder solche äh, wissenschaftlichen äh, Beschäftigungen mit dem Thema Antisemitismus, was, was aktuell, äh, was aktuell auch Auswirkungen hat auf die Politik, äh, sich damit zu beschäftigen und das anzu, äh, solche Konferenzen anzureden. Matthias Künzel, Dr. Matthias Künzel ist mir schon ähm, seit längerem bekannt und es ist mir eine große Ehre, dass ich ihn heute auch äh, moderieren darf. Ähm, mir bekannt und wahrscheinlich Ihnen auch bekannt, ähm, schon durch das Buch Dschihad und Judenhass, was zumindest in Deutschland ähm, das Thema Islamismus und Antisemitismus ähm, sehr, stark, ähm, also das sehr stark als Thema gesetzt hat eingefordert hat, dass sich da Wissenschaftler, Wissenschaftler verstärkt mit beschäftigen, was leider zu wenig meiner Ansicht nach passiert ist. Ähm, Dr. Matthias Künzel ist ähm, Politikwissenschaftler und Publizist, ähm, ist ähm, Research Associate der, des äh, Vital Sassoon International Center for Study of Antisemitism und im Vorstand äh, der Scholars for Peace in der Middle East. Und ich hoffe, dass sein neues Buch, was ich gesehen habe, was angekündigt ist, Verhängnisvolle Freundschaft, Deutschland, die Mullers und das Atom, das, was wahrscheinlich erst im Herbst rauskommt, aber dass es da vielleicht schon den einen oder anderen Artikel vorher gibt zu dem Inhalt. Aber jetzt will ich nicht weiter reden, denn Matthias Günfel und Charles Small ähm, sollen ja auch noch zu Wort kommen. Ich weiß nicht, wie die Reihenfolge ist. Ich glaube, Charles Small fängt, fängt an und dann kommen im Anschluss direkt Dr. Matthias Günfel und dann können wir vielleicht Fragen ähm, stellen. Danke. Okay, so, Dr. Thank you very much. And today I'm going to speak about issues of antisemitism in Iran or within the Iranian regime. In particular, and when I speak about the regime with Iran, I'm speaking about the regime. Um, before I start, I would like to say, and I think the theme in my presentation, and I suspect in some of the other papers, is that when it comes to issues of anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism always starts with Jews, but it never ends with Jews. And the, uh, those who follow the ideology, the genocidal ideology of anti-Semitism, inevitably, in one form or another, end up targeting other marginalized groups in society, be it minorities, gay people, women, etc. And the Iranian regime is no different uh, in, in this case. Given the fact that we're speaking about a genocidal anti-Semitic movement, and in the case, uh, you know, the backdrop is the Iran's the government's uh, attempt to acquire a nuclear bomb and as Ahmadinejad said and Khomeini said to wipe Israel off the map in one uh, one swoop in one firestorm and it's always as the Imam says and this is a part that is not often in the translations it's always as the Imam says and I'll, I'll speak to this in a moment but given the fact that I'll be speaking about an attempt or at least an incitement to genocide, which the Iranian regime has been engaged in for many years, openly and honestly and straightforwardly, that sitting here in Berlin, I would just like to 
pay tribute in a small, simple way to a friend. A friend of mine called me from Jerusalem yesterday and she was speaking to me about her grandfather, uh, Yosef ben Ivgunia, and, and his mother and the, his sister Hannah, who were killed in the Holocaust, in the Shoah, in the, in the 40s. And here we are in 2009 speaking about genocidal anti-Semitism and a movement which is dedicated to, among other things, um, eradicating or wiping Israel off the face of the earth. So I think we need to put this issue squarely in this context. And I think speaking here in Berlin, it, this, to me at least, uh, is poignant. I think in the last 24 hours that I've been in Berlin, I've had the opportunity to meet with people uh, in the German uh, Chamber of Commerce and some political organizations here, which I won't name. And I, I can say, and I think this is sort of permeating among, among some political circles, I would say among the NGO community, the human rights community, and within the academia in Berlin, in Germany, in Europe, and it's not that different in North America, I'm ashamed to say. But there seems to be a form of denial that's going on. Uh, the inability to look at a very serious problem which has only been growing. And it's not just the Iranian attempts to acquire a nuclear weapons program or nuclear energy with a weapons program, but it's also the social movement of radical Islamicism, radical Islamicism not to be confused with Islam, but radical Islam, which at its core has a genocidal anti-Semitic uh, message, which is beginning to resonate and beginning to take hold. And I must say that some of the people I've met here, people who ought to know what this social movement represents, given the pride that Germans take in their education, in their Holocaust education, that Germany, of all the European countries that participated, all the societies that participated in the Shoah, Germany is proud of its education, that, that they will learn from their past, that you will learn from your past, and not to repeat the horrific mistakes <coughs> of history. And yet, I must say that the arrogance, and I don't use the term lightly, that I met in the last 24 hours was astounding. And I would urge people to look at this issue with a sense of humility, particularly in some main political parties that ought to know better. And it was very disheartening to meet members of the Chamber of Commerce who also were unable to intellectually be honest and to deal with the issues at hand, to deal with the nature of the regime, to deal with what it's doing externally in the region, the threats it's making to Israel, and the human rights abuses and oppression that just keep mounting and mounting within the Iranian society. And people are turning a blind eye for a few euros and a few jobs. And it's rather pathetic. And I hope that somehow the business community, some political, political parties and scholars who ought to know better will come to the fore and start speaking on this urgently because my message would be simply that people dismiss the possibility of the Israelis taking it upon themselves to defend themselves. That somehow by the Israelis defending themselves it's going to create chaos and wreak havoc in the world. But I would argue that if the Europeans and the Germans do not take a stand now when there's time, don't start blaming the Israelis for defending their lives. Because it's been business as usual far too long. You can't do business with these people and then distance yourselves from the implications and the ramifications. And as uh, Martin Luther King, the great civil rights leader in the United States, constantly said, that every action and every inaction has equal ramifications, they're equally power, powerful. For every action we take and every inaction we take are equally powerful. And he was never concerned, Martin Luther King was never concerned about the actions or inactions of evil people or bad people. 
What he was greatly concerned about was the inaction of the vast majority of good people. And on this issue, internationally and here in Germany, there's been a deafening silence. Elie Wiesel last year came to Yale University. And for me, Elie Wiesel um, is not only a great scholar and thinker, philosopher, he also, of course, wrote, I think, in, in powerful terms about his childhood memories, about the Holocaust, the Shoah, how it affected him. And I think with a great sense of humility in the keeping of a sort of Hasidic rabbinical tradition, he comes across in a humble and honest way. And he's always also been engaged in other issues, from uh, South Africa to Rwanda to Cambodia. He's been at the forefront of not only human rights, but trying to teach people to close the gap, that when we see injustice, we have to act. And there's a gap, perhaps, in human nature, and he's always been uh, trying to teach us to close this gap between witnessing something that's unjust and doing something to bring about justice. And he spoke at Yale University's law school in front of a packed audience of about 800 people, 800 of the finest uh, scholars in the United States and some of the leading faculty in the country. And he spoke about the possibility of another Holocaust. And having grown up in uh, Montreal, in my synagogue, there was a large group of people that came from Sigit, where he came from in Romania. So he would come to our synagogue regularly and speak. So as a child growing up, I would hear him speak uh, once or twice a year throughout my, my life. And here he was, approaching 80 years old, he's roughly 80 years old, and here he was speaking in his lifetime about the possibility of another Holocaust. And I thought, my God, where, where have we come to? What have we gone? How, how pathetic that in his lifetime, he actually has to give a lecture of this nature. And it was very disturbing for me. But then he went on to say that the thing that really bothers him, as if this wasn't enough, is that people are not doing anything. People are quiet. That students are not active and not engaged, that faculty members are not dealing with this issue. The Jewish leadership in the United States is not engaged as it should be. And of course, governments in the West are being negligent and irresponsible. That this is what's bothering him, that nobody's doing anything about it. And I also had another encounter a few months ago with Natan Sharansky in Israel. And uh, as a student, I was part of the student struggle for Soviet Jewry, and in 1984 I went to Moscow and then Leningrad to meet with Refusniks. And I met, actually met Sharansky's mother and brother in Moscow. And um, I met Sharansky a few months ago in Israel, and he was telling me that when he was in solitary, solitary confinement in a, a, an isolated cell in the Soviet Gulag, when things were as bleak as they ever were, he knew that one day he'd be free and that one day he'd be in Jerusalem. He knew it. And he knew it because, as he put it, hundreds of thousands of housewives and students were marching in the streets all over Europe and North America screaming, let my people go. And he knew one day he'd be free. And he asked me, he said, Charles, what is going on? What is going on in Europe and North America? Why does nobody care about the weapons program of Iran? about the human rights abuses of the Iranian regime and of radical, not Islam, but radical Islam and the social movement which is diametrically opposed to everything we believe in in democracy. If you're left-wing or right-wing, if you're religious or secular, if you're Muslim, Christian, Jewish, atheist, agnostic, Buddhist, it doesn't matter. If you believe in any sense of democracy, any form of citizenship, if you believe in women's rights, gay rights, if you're opposed to genocide of any group, then this social movement, which is marching forward and gaining strength after strength after strength as time passes, which is an affront to basic democratic principles and basic notions of citizenship, we remain silent. And not only do we remain silent, I was recently in Canada visiting York University where Jewish students in the Jewish Center, the Hillel, three weeks ago now, were basically held hostage by a, a mob of about 200 students protesting against Jewish students in favor, apparently, 
of Palestinian rights. So here were white Christian or European Canadians who claimed to be on the left, who were supporting Hamas uh, during anti-apartheid week with a few Middle Eastern students, a few Muslim students, and they charged or stormed the Hillel, which is in the student center, and eight students were trapped inside, and outside there was a mob of more than 200 students screaming, Jews out of Palestine, Jews out of York University, kill, and I won't repeat the other words that were being hurled at the students. After several hours, several police officers were able to enter the Hillel and pass through the mob, which were chanting death threats. And after eight hours, we were able to escort the students out of the hill. And this is in a nice neighborhood, a middle, upper middle class neighborhood of Toronto, Canada, where during anti-apartheid week, students were chanting death to Jews and, and death to Israel and the like, calling Israel a Nazi state, a fascist state, an apartheid state, and the like. And I would just like to urge you, and the presentation I gave in Canada was a comparison between the Hamas Charter, which I'm sure many of you have read, and the South African Freedom Charter. And the South African Freedom Charter is based on the ANC Freedom Charter. When I was a student in the 80s and 90s, I was part of the anti-apartheid movement. I was actually the chairperson of the ANC, the African National Congress Solidarity Committee of Canada, sorry, of Quebec. And I was active in Canada, in Europe, and was invited by the ANC leadership to South Africa on two occasions. Um, was an international observer of the first uh, unbanned political parties that took place in South Africa in 1991, and went to witness elections and other events on another occasion. So here I was, a Jewish, uh, Canadian, progressive, social democrat, loosely, I'll define that loosely, engaged in human rights issues, leading the anti-apartheid movement in Quebec. And I did so because if you read the South African Freedom Charter, the South African Freedom Charter was opposed to the apartheid racist regime, but it clearly states and stipulated in, in bold terms in the social democratic tradition or essence that in the future South Africa, when the apartheid system was defeated, that all South Africans would be free and equal before the law that regardless of gender, race, religion, ethnicity, language, and the, the list is long, in keeping with social democracy, the ANC and the broad coalition against apartheid enshrined and promised that every citizen would be equal in a new and free South Africa. And I think to a large extent, particularly the judiciary and the legal system in South Africa, is making an attempt to follow into a social democratic tradition with hiccups and uh, problems and contradictions, but there is a legal body of knowledge which is emerging and developing in which all citizens' rights are guaranteed in a free South Africa. So here, fast forward 15, 20 years later, and ignorant scholars and ignorant students are now comparing Israel to an apartheid regime, to a Nazi regime. And the incredible thing is, if you would read the Hamas Charter, Hamas, which is now controlling Gaza, uh, which the Israelis withdrew, is no longer an occupied territory. Hamas, which is supported by and sponsored and had developed militarily and ideologically by the Iranian revolutionary regime, which controls Gaza, and perhaps some would say can at will or will perhaps in the future take over the rest of uh, the West Bank and, and the occupied territories. That here is a regime which in their founding document, in their covenant, in their charter, and you can Google it tonight, it's available in German and English and French, it's all over the internet, it will take you 20 minutes to read. And I would urge you to read the Hamas Charter and compare it to the South African Freedom Charter. In the Hamas Charter, it literally, in black and white and in simple terms, like the Iranian regime, like Hezbollah, Hezbollah also, supports, as you know, supported by the regime in Iran, literally calls in black and white for the killing of Jews. Now, 
The important thing about the Hamas Charter is that this is not the rantings and ravings of a few crazy extreme people in a broad, large Hamas party. This is the founding document. This is the raison d'etre of Hamas. Not only does it call explicitly for the destruction of the State of Israel, it also calls for the killing of Zionists, Israelis, and Jews, in black and white, in the founding covenant, in the founding constitution. And not only that, if, if it wasn't so serious, and if it wasn't so horrific, it would almost be comical. Here is a radical Islamic organization that is trying to recreate a caliphate, trying to recreate uh, some sort of glorious Islamic past and put impose Sharia law on <coughs> Palestine and all of Palestine to get rid of the Jews and the Christians and the Crusaders. It's trying to free the entire area, like Iran, of all outsiders, of all people who are different. And in doing so, not only calls for a genocide, but uses the most pernicious European form of genocidal antisemitism known to humanity. It takes the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, this forgery which came from in Europe in the, in the late 1800s, turn of the century, originated probably in France and or in Russia, and helped to spread lies in Europe, which paved the way conceptually, intellectually, and politically for the Shoah, for the Holocaust justified the killing of people and the killing of people on a mass scale. And of course it blamed the Jews for some of all these secret conspiracies and it was the most pernicious form of European anti-Semitism going. So here's a group which the raison d'etre apparently is to rid itself of foreign uh, influence and to create some pure Islamic society with no foreign intervention. But if you read the Hamas Charter, the theme throughout the Hamas Charter is lifted from the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. It's, it's not only a horrific document, they should be sued for plagiarism. They should be banned from the United States. In the United States we have freedom of expression and freedom of uh, speech that uh, some would say is too much compared to other countries. But in, in, in universities, you know, if you plagiarize, you're kicked out. If you're a student or faculty, it's not tolerated. So if anything, I think Hamas should be banned from universities, at least for its plagiarism, it's not for, if not for its genocidal anti-Semitism. Thank you, Mr. Devils. Thank you, Charles. Several 
uh, Muslim and Middle Eastern countries, and certainly Iran as being uh, the exporter of this type of ideology. There's constant, and this is a direct quote from the Charter, constant attempts and attention through information campaign, films and school curriculum, using for their purposes their lackeys who are infiltrated through, so, who are infiltrated through Zionist organizations under various names and shapes, such as the Freemasons, the Rotary Club, and espionage groups, and others, which are all or nothing more than cells of saboteurs and subversives. These organizations have ample resources that enable them to play their role in societies for the purpose of achieving the Zionist target and to deepen the concept that the world should serve the enemy. These organizations operate in the absence of Islam and its estrangement from its people. The Islamic people should perform their role in confronting these conspirators and these saboteurs. The day Islam is in control, of guiding the affairs of life, these organizations hostile, hostile to humanity and Islam will be obliterated. So here, this is just from the charter in, of uh, Hamas, and it, you can see the themes of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion um, permeating this. This is one famous quote from the Hamas charter from the preamble, it states, and I quote, the day of judgment will not come about until Muslims fight the Jews, killing the Jews, when the Jews will hide behind stones and trees. The stones and trees will say, oh, Muslims, oh, Abdullah, there's a Jew behind me, come and kill him. So we can see that these are clear and serious issues. And I should say that I've also experienced this, particularly in Germany, there's this fear here among the circles not to be so directly aligned with Jewish money or Israel or organizations in the United States that somehow are connected to groups fighting anti-Semitism, that somehow this is tainted. And I think that this is vestiges of the old European anti-Semitism that needs to be understood, unpacked, and assessed, that the fight for basic human rights, the fight, the, the fight for social democracy in the broadest terms, the fight against hatred has to be open and direct. And everybody, regardless of their backgrounds, their ethnic backgrounds, or religious backgrounds, or affiliations, who want to participate in the struggle should be equal members and participate in the struggle and not to be painted with stereotypes that we need to be confronting and fighting into the future. So I just want to state that clearly. Ahmadinejad, as we know, in 2005 had a conference entitled The World Without Zionism, and I quote, The establishment of the Zionist regime, according to Ahmadinejad, was a move by the world oppressors against the Islamic world, and that the state of Israel was illegitimate. Referring to Ayatollah Khomeini, Ahmadinejad said, as the Imam said, Israel must be wiped off the map. Ahmadinejad and the clique that are in power and the regime, the regime in power now, basically believe in their sort of the twelver branch of Shiite Islam. In Shiite Islam there's a belief that a Imam, the twelfth Imam will appear, Muhammad al-Mahdi, and that he's in lineal descent from the Prophet, who is said to have gone into a state of occultation in 1874. And that in Shiite Islam there's a belief that he will reappear. The, the group that is associated with Ahmadinejad is a group of people that believe in sort of a radical vision of this, and they believe that they can help usher in this time or era in which the Imam will appear, and that they can do certain things to help speed up the process. So Ahmadinejad is a part of this small group, and the small group is led by the teachings of, of Muhammad, sorry, Ayatollah Muhammad, Taki Basba Yazdi, and that these people are sort of behind this movement. Ahmadinejad, as some of you may know here, um, after his election, his surprise election, one of the first things he did was allocate about $17 million to uh, revamp and to build the Jam Karan Mosque that will house um, the Mahdi when he will emerge. In 
November of 2005, the regime said publicly that the main mission of the Islamic Republic was to the reappearance and the bringing about of the Imam. When Ahmadinejad first came to the General Assembly, he said, and this is a direct quote in the United Nations in New York, he said that he felt the, this is quote, I felt the atmosphere suddenly change, and for those 27 or 28 minutes, the leaders of the world did not blink. It seemed as if the, the hand was holding them there, and it opened their eyes to receive the message from the Islamic Republic. So here, he later spoke in press conferences how he felt that the, the chamber was bathed in green light, that this was the beginning of the reemergence of the imam. When Ahmadinejad came to New York that time, you may remember that when he spoke at Columbia University, he stated that there were no gay people in Iran. And at Columbia, the reaction of the audience, and these were you know, people who are studying Middle Eastern studies, scholars, students, and others, the reaction was to laugh. Because it's such an absurd statement to say that there's no gay people in Iran. But I think what we need to understand, and we need to take time, is to, really, is to really study the language and the philosophy and the worldview of those who believe in radical Islam. Because in radical Islam, you cannot accept homosexuality or gay people in society. It contravenes the teachings that they believe in. And as we know, gay people are oppressed in Iran and gay people are actually in some cases being murdered. I have two more minutes, but I want to get to one last point that I think is very important. When Ahmadinejad came to the United Nations this past year, in September of 08, he spoke, and I won't go into the quotes, I have all the quotes, but basically he spoke about how Islam was a religion, a world religion of peace, and that he wants to join forces with other religions of peace. And he was mentioning, they're referring to Christianity. But he spoke about how the Zionist regime and a small clique of Zionists, a small clique of Jews, are controlling the economic resources of the world. And how basically coming out of the protocols of the elders of Zion, and if you look at the media, the, the reports coming out of Iran in popular culture and certainly from the government, they're using these images and conspiracy theories from the protocols to drive home their point. And he basically said that it's a small clique of people that are destroying the world. And unfortunately, when you look at what happened at York University among secular students who are yelling that Israel is a Nazi state and an apartheid state, the anti-Semitism in which the Iranian revolution is pushing and pumping into the West, into non-Muslim societies, is beginning to percolate, it's beginning to have an effect. You can see it in Venezuela, you can see it in South Africa, which I know when the Deputy Foreign Minister of South Africa last month blamed the Jews on destroying the economy in the United States or holding control of the economy, the crowd in which he spoke to, 16,000 people erupted wildly in applause. That Iran is now using the economic crisis, it's using the cleavages globally, the economic, social, and cultural cleavages globally to speak to marginalized people. And it's beginning to have an effect, and I think that we need to, to really take note of this. So, just to close, and I'm sort of being cut off in, in midstream, that I think I would urge you, when, when I speak in the United States, I usually put up a show, show of hands, how many people have read the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, uh, how many people read the Hamas Charter, how many people read Fatwas, how many people read the Iranian, the Hamas, and Hezbollah press? I urge you to do it. And in the age of the internet, it's, it's very easy and it's not that time consuming. Start reading what these people are, are saying, what these people believe in. We need to understand what they're thinking in order to, to confront them. Um, I'll just put one, one short point to show you that this is not just an issue of Zionism versus the Iranian regime or Hamas and Hezbollah. I recently have been engaged in a project about Jewish people coming from Iran and settling in Israel and the United States. And I met a Jewish woman who lives in uh, New York. She comes from Tehran. And she told me this story. 
When she was a young teenager in Tehran, her good neighbors were Muslim next door to her. Uh, they had good relations. One day her telephone, the Jewish woman's family's phone, telephone broke at home, and she went to the neighbor to ask if she could call her father at the shop to tell the father that they're from the family's home and they're waiting for the father, but the phone is broken. So the, the Muslim neighbor, who knew her for a long time, was very gracious and said, of course you can use the phone and you can call your father. She phoned the father, everything was okay. The next day, the Jewish woman who I met, uh, met the servant or the, the, the cleaning person in the, in the Muslim family's home in Tehran. And she, the cleaning woman told the Jewish woman that the owners of the house made her disassemble the telephone and wash it with alcohol 15 times. Why? Why did she do this? Because in some forms of Shiite Islam, Jews are impure. And this goes back uh, that the Tzadik, there's people who work on this issue, the impurity of Jews is profound. There were fatwas, religious rulings that stipulated and state that Jews were not allowed to go into the rain. And to this day in Iran, they don't go into the rain. They're forbidden because they're impure. And if, they, if, they, if it's raining, the impurity will go into the environment if it touches Jews. And there's all fatwas that really started in the 17th century and are still being held, by, especially by the regime, they're all discussions that if you're standing in the rain and there's a Jew whose clothes begins to become permeated with water and the water starts to drip and the dripping water from the Jewish clothes, the Jewish person's clothes, touches, touches the pavement, what do you do with the pavement? Well, there's a religious discussion. <coughs> the ruling is you have to take the pavement, dig it up and destroy it, do away with it and replace it. That these notions of impurity are very much a part of the objectification and the demonization of Jews in that part of the world, in Shiite Islam. Not all rulings, but some rulings. And this is the group of people, the clique of power, people that are in power. So the demonization of the state of Israel is also connected to anti-Semitism and the hatred of Jews, which exists in that part of the world. And I think that this is also at play, and this should also be understood, that if you believe in democratic basic rights, citizenship, that these issues need to be understood and then confirmed. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much for your interest. My topic is Germany and Iran, a special relationship. And let me start with an observation. If you look up the English version of Wikipedia on the topic German-Iranian relations, you will find a long entry with more than 50 footnotes. If you look up the French version of Wikipedia, Relations entre l'Allemagne et l'Iran, we have also an entry a shorter entry with seven footnotes. If you look up the German version of Wikipedia, we have about Deutsch-Iranische Beziehungen. We have no entry at all. So this is interesting that in other countries, there is a kind of awareness that there is a kind of uh, particular situation between Iran and Germany. But in this country, obviously, this awareness does not exist in the same way. In Germany only, a few dozen specialists are informed about the special relationship, among them Peter Rudolf, a former researcher of the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, who wrote about German, Germany's, quote, historically shaped strategic preference to Iran. The historically shaped strategic preference to Iran. In addition, the notion of a, quote, traditional German-Iranian friendship is quite often used to attract new German investments in Iran. Friendship, of course, is something good. Traditional friendship is even better. But in this case, in the case of the so-called German-Iranian friendship, there is a flaw embedded in the notion of traditional friendship or in the notion of an historically shaped preference. This concept of friendship <coughs> is contaminated by the inclusion of Nazi Germany. 
this good tradition does not exclude but include the time between <coughs> 1933 and 1945. To give you just one example, in the year 1996, the president of Iran, Rafsanjani, when he praised the German-Iranian friendship, he emphasized, quote, our relationship was always good. Both our people are of Aryan origin. And he recalled the time between 1941 and 1945 when Iran was occupied by the Allied powers because of the friendship between Germany and Iran and that the Iranians, even during those years, supported the German cause. Many Germans who visited Iran mention how much praise for Adolf Hitler still exists. Christiana Hoffmann, who reported for the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, mentions in her book of 2008, quote, the open admiration of many Iranians for Hitler, and quote, an accentuation of the good German-Iranian relationship during the time of Nazi Germany.
was the very first Western Foreign Minister to visit Tehran. During those years, Iran was considered to be a pariah state for different reasons. Mr. Genscher, nevertheless, broke the taboo and started in 1984 a kind of Sonderweg vis-à-vis -vis Iran, which was not supported by any other Western nation. One of the reasons was, according to Mr. Genscher, that Iran was a country, quote, without any bad thought or bad memory towards Germany, end quote. In the year 1995, the head of the Iranian state intelligence, Ali Falamian, was an official guest of the German government. The German state prosecutors at that time wanted to arrest Falayan immediately after his arrival on German soil because he was a guy behind the murder of four leading Iranian Kurds in a Berlin restaurant called Mykonos. But the government said, no, don't touch him, he's our guest. Falayan revealed during his trip that there was a close relationship between the German and the Iranian intelligence agencies, which includes the delivery of hardware from Munich to Tehran, a training program for Iranian intelligence people in Munich, and the exchange of name lists. The United States and the United Kingdom publicly complained about this visit, the German, uh, and, uh, about this visit uh, in this uh, special field. But this was again justified, in this case by Foreign Minister Klaus Kinkel, with a quote, consideration that the Germans and the Iranians are connected by a 100 years old tradition of good relationship. And today, throughout the decades, there was a silent acceptance that the notion of traditional friendship includes the former relation towards NATO Germany as well. This tactical agreement does not work any longer. It was torpedoed by the Islamist leadership of Iran, which came into the open by putting the denial of the Holocaust in the center of its foreign policy, by broadcasting a Nazi-style anti-Semitism via different satellite channels throughout the world, and by openly planning to destroy Israel. Now, Germany's position towards Iran is at a crossroads. Some years ago, Carsten Vogt, the coordinator of German-American relationship, addressed the choice which is imminent today. Either Germany continues to accept, uh, to, to accept the Iranian point of view, that this is a quote of Carsten Vogt, that the German-Iranian friendship includes the time of the Kaiser and the time of Adolf Hitler as well, end quote. Or Germany starts to pursue a policy towards Iran which is based on values such as human rights, democracy, and the international law. A third option does not exist. And I would like to have a controversial and little debate about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your both very strong words. And I uh, will immediately um, give the, the floor the possibility to ask questions. Um, I think what, what you pointed out, Matthias, is that the, the, the traditional, very strong uh, commercial ties between Iran and uh, Germany are still ongoing, and there is, I think it's very clear that there is now this crossroad. And um, your astonishment, Charles, maybe, or, uh, is about, about the, I mean, the title was the, the, the German response to the answers made in Iran. And you didn't talk much about it because obviously there is not much of a response to it, or the response to it is, um, um, well, a non-response really. So the, the inclusion of the Holocaust, what I learned in Holocaust education, um, I learned that the um, the 
The anti-Semitism was central to the Nazis, and the Holocaust wasn't a byproduct. And I also learned that the Holocaust, or this mass murder, was possible. Basically, I mean, anti-Semitism has existed before, and it was possible then because the government made it central in their policy anti-Semitism. And here we have a state um, where I think it's, it's hard to not to see that anti-Semitism is a, is a very central element um, in their, I don't know, in their attitudes, in their policy. Um, so this special relationship in Germany now, and to, to, as you pointed out, with the Holocaust denial, uh, Germany has to answer this question. I mean, this is an open, and, I mean, you, you put this question, but so far, I mean, not many people even put this question. So um, I wonder how we, I mean, how this, this can, the awareness of this can be raised. Um, but now, really, I want to open the floor to get into a discussion with, um, with all of you. And I think we have about 15 minutes to do that. And who, who has um, some, some question to either Matthias and Charles, or both of them? Thank you, Matthias, and thank you, Charles, for your uh, elaborate presentations on that. And I would like to follow up Günther's uh, remarks on uh, one uh, very frequent argument that is made regarding the anti-Semitism of the Iranian regime is, and I, I think you were well aware of, of Roger Cohen's latest contributions to the New York Times, dealing with the Jewish community in Iran, and basically claiming it's not that bad. It's, it's, if this regime would be really uh, similar in their views of anti-Semitism to the Nazis, they would have eradicated the Jewish community long ago. And obviously they did do it, even if you take graphic examples like you did, Charles, with the uh, cleaning of the telephone. Uh, but still, there must be some kind of difference in the behavior and attitude of the regime towards Jews, Jews in general. Uh, I just would like you both maybe to elaborate on that a bit further. Well, uh, thank you very much. I think this is a very, very important question because anti Semitism um, in Iran is not so obvious as the Nazi anti Semitism or the Charter of Hamas. It's a bit more hidden, and it's always uh, the telling of Ahmadinejad to say, well, we are not against the Jews, we are against the Zionists. But Ahmadinejad is using the word Zionism and Zionists exactly in the same meaning as Adolf Hitler used the word Judas, by making Zionism responsible for every evil in the world, be it the cartoons of uh, Mohammed in Denmark, be it the destruction of the Golden Dome in Iraq, be it other things in the world, like his last uh, speech uh, in front of the United Nations clearly showed. So he, he uses the, 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 the expression of Zionism and Zionists exactly in the same way as Hitler used the word Juden. And to come to the topic of the Jews in Iran, of course, it's, uh, uh, it's clear that there is no other uh, such big Jewish community in any part of this region except for Israel. And their conditions of living are not unacceptable. They are suppressed in a way, even a bit more suppressed, of course, than Muslims in the country, but not so much uh, suppressed that they can't uh, have their religious tradition and have their synagogues. But if you read, for example, the homepage of the Jewish community in, in, in Tehran, uh, there is an English-written homepage uh, from, from those uh, a group of people. It's a um, pity, and it's 
very, of course, um, uh, um, depressing um, when, for example, again and again the Iranian leadership arrested some of the Jews in Iran. Of course, the community had to say, well, this is correct, this is good, and we praise it because it's not against the Jews, but only against some criminals among us. So this is a kind of, of, of obedience which they have to pay for getting accepted. And on the same time, there is a really strong anti-Semitism also against Jews by spreading, for example, the protocol of the al Zion and other uh, uh, written papers or also television shows which are really anti-Semitic, so the Jews in Iran have to accept this kind of hatred in general terms. And up to now, they are not the victims of the direct uh, physical suppression. But this can come later on as well. I don't know, maybe it's also a kind of blackmailing uh, a, a point for Ahmadinejad that they, he can say, well, if Israel would attack us, the Jews in Tehran would be the victims. So maybe it's also a kind of tactical play, but this does not mean that the regime of Iran is not anti Semitic, but we have to explain more in this case than we have to explain in the case of the Hamas Qaeda, which is much more obvious. I'll just add very quickly, uh, of course the, the, the Jews of Iran are roughly 20 to 25,000 people and they're the largest Jewish community in the Middle East outside of Israel, so I think it's very important to realize and of course, as Matthias was saying, their situation is precarious and Roger Cohn should be ashamed. Um, he was actually, he spoke in a synagogue in California and there's a tape that exists of this and I can actually help people who are interested to get access to it, where he acknowledged this talk at a synagogue, people were asking him critical questions about this uh, story, and he admitted in the, in the synagogue that he had a minder uh, from the government to send somebody with him to uh, be with him at all times, and they were present in every interview. So can you imagine being Jewish in Iran today? There's a government official acting as a translator, and you're standing there between the reporter of the New York Times, Roger Cohn, who's also Jewish, you're an Iranian Jew, and the government officials are translating and witnessing this. What, what are they going to say? And he did not put this in his article. We should be ashamed. This is shoddy journalism. Are there any more questions? We could have offered Deutschland. Do you think? So is Arab or Muslim anti-Semitism religious dominated? 
Yeah, yeah this, this is the, I think, as far as I understood it, if you agree that it's a religious anti-Semitism and not a racist anti-Semitism. That's, that's a good question. Um, first of all, I think it's important to realize that there's definitely a religious component, particularly within radical Islam. Matthias does work on this, and Bassam Tibi, who's an Islamic scholar at our center now from Germany, who's an expert on Islam, is looking at anti-Semitism, or as he calls it, Judeophobia, because he thinks that anti-Semitism is European, and there is hatred of Jews within Islamic text and Islamic culture, and uh, he focuses on that, not anti-Semitism. Although, like Matthias and Jeffrey Herf and Bassam Tibi, they're looking at the importation of anti-Semitism into the Middle East and into Islamic uh, context. But I think it's very important to look at the religious dynamic within, religion, within radical Islam. And it's interesting to note that the Jewish people, uh, with their self-determination within Israel, are the only others in the region to have self-determination other than Muslims. And I think this is a very important uh, issue to, to take note of, and I think it plays a key role, and it's becoming more and more important, I think as uh, modern nation states, as secular nation states are becoming weaker and crumbling, and radical Islam and Islamic ideo ideology is becoming more powerful, the self-determination of the other, and I think especially Jews, on what is perceived as Islamic land becomes very serious and very important, and I think within that context, uh, peace becomes more and more difficult, recognition becomes more problematic. Um, and I would say that if you look at the writings of uh, Emmanuel Levinas or the discourse on, say, on multiculturalism as understood, uh, I think, internationally and, and, and in Western social democracies, the recognition of the other is key. If there's no recognition of the other, then there can be no peace, there can be no reconciliation. If one group of people is bent for so-called religious, and I say so-called religious uh, reasons, because this is not Islam, there's one and a half billion Muslims with different traditions and different perceptions of what Islam is, but one growing form of Islam uh, sees the Jews in horrifically derogatory ways as subhuman, as uh, causing all sorts of trouble. And uh, if there's no recognition of the other, if there's a genocidal view for the other, we have to take note of it and we have to confront it. You can't appease it. This is not multiculturalism to accept it. But then I think in a nutshell that anti-Semitism has different layers. I think when the world saw through a lens of religion, the Jews were the wrong religion. When the, when the world viewed uh, biology, race, and ethnicity, and nation as the way to see the world, the Jews were the wrong nation, the wrong race, the wrong ethnicity. And today, in, uh, among radical Muslims, and I think among radical, some radical lefts, leftists in the West, the Jews are once again the wrong nation. And what's um, terrifying and important about this form of anti-Semitism is that each, each model of anti-Semitism held as the solution that if the Jews would change, the world would be saved. If the Jews would leave the uh, the territory and not pollute the race, the race and the nation would be saved. And now people are saying if Israel would only leave the region and we could, you know, get rid of Israel, everything would be okay. Islam will be okay, the West will be left in peace. And I think this is an, a key component of anti-Semitism, which is part of the discourse, the mainstream discourse now, which is very uh, terrifying and very serious. Well, uh Thank you for this question, which is, of course, uh, also extremely important. In one point I agree, in another point I disagree. Uh, I agree you're correct to say that racism is normally not a part of Islamist thinking, because it was a German and a European tradition uh, based on Darwin, social Darwinism. And of course, for the Islamists, Mr. Darwin is uh, a Jew, a Jew, because he changed the Quran and his history of the world is not the same as the Quran's history and so on and so forth. So they, they, they can't be Darwinists and you won't never find words like half Jew or quarter Jew uh, in Islamic language. So this is correct. 
But on the other hand, I think it's not correct to say it's just a religious anti-Semitism. Because during the Second World War, also via the German radio broadcast to Iran, a lot of European anti-Semitism came into those countries. And even Khomeini was an ardent listener of these broadcasts from Germany. So he accepted this kind of conspiracy theories, saying that the world is bad because of the Jews. Which is not especially racist, but it's another, part, another kind of political motivated anti-Semitism. And when Khomeini tried to come to power, uh, beginning with the year 1963, he very much used anti-Semitism in order to get more popular. Uh, the, the, um, he very much used Israel, saying, well, even the Shah is a Jew and, and, and Israel is uh, trying to change our country and trying to attack our country, and, and a, a lot of fantasies uh, which just were uh, uh, used to uh, get more uh, supporters. And I think the real term, and this is a, 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 well, of course, Iran is not Nazi Germany. There are so many, many, many big differences. But in the ideology, there is one similar thing. The anti-Semitism of the Germans and the anti-Semitism of the Iranian regime today is a kind of redemptive anti-Semitism. They say, we can redeem the world, we can be very alone if we fight the Jews. Uh, you have to get rid of Israel in order to liberate the world. This was the wording of Ahmadinejad at the end of the conference of the Holocaust in Nice in December 2006. And we have the same quotes uh, by German uh, Nazis saying, if we want to liberate the world, we have to get rid of the Jews. So this is the danger. If you have this conspiracy theory, if you believe in the uh, ideology that the Jews are responsible for every war, uh, responsible for every uh, strife, uh, responsible for every ugliness in the world, then if you want to create a good and better world, you have to get rid of them. So this is, I think, the similarity. And this is not only religious, this is very, very much influenced by European entities. Eine letzte Frage äh, nehmen und da sehe ich eine Hand, die ähm, hochgeht. Vielleicht können wir das Mikrofon nochmal ähm, weitergeben. Und anschließend wollen wir nur eine ganz kurze Pause machen, dass, wir, äh, dass jeder noch was Gelegenheit hat, was zu trinken, äh, aber dass wir nicht uns zu sehr verstreut mit sind. Excuse me, I'll speak in English. I just want to make one comment on the question of the religious anti-Semitism. I agree, fully agree that it is religious anti-Semitism, but you also have to remember that radical Islam is extremely intolerant to any all other religions. If you look at what happened, Islam is tolerant to other religions when, when people of other religions know that they are inferior to Muslims and they accept Muslim superiority. I'll give you an example of the opposite. In 1860, in Damascus, when the Christian minority in Damascus was perceived to be too provocative to Muslims because they uh, took seriously the, the um, equality they received under the law. They could ring church bells on Sundays and they could hold processions with their icons. So in 1860, there was a major pogrom against Christians in Damascus because they, they provoked the Muslims. They became, they don't know their place. And a similar thing is, was happening in the 1970s in Egypt when the radical Muslims attacked the Copts in southern Egypt because the Copts, again, were too provocative. They were going with crosses and it annoys Muslims. And today you can see something similar in Iraq. When Christians are targeted in Iraq, again, because they are too provocative. So it is, and it is religious, but it's intolerant for other religions if they don't know their right place. And the right place should be below Muslims. It isn't the, the view of radical Islam in, in the region today. So um, we, we're going to have a, a short, very short break, and then we have two other topics after the break, um, Hezbollah and um, the Iran and Hamas connection. Um, there are some drinks, it's getting tranked in your uh,